Chapter 6 Naomi's best bet for obtaining a car was Frances. She didn't think Florence would give her the time of day, and Virgil has been absolutely irritated with her when they have spoken the previous day. Naomi remembered what Virgil had said about men doing as she wanted. It bothered her to be thought of poorly. She wanted to be like. Perhaps this explains the parties, the crystalline laughter, the well coiffed hair, the rehearsal smile. She thought that men such as her father could be stern and men could be cold like Virgil. But a woman needed to be like or they'll be in trouble. A woman who is not like is a bitch, and a bitch can hardly do anything. All avenues are close to her. Well, she definitely didn't like feel like in this house, but Frances was friendly enough. She found him near the kitchen, looking more washed out than the previous days. A slim figure of ivory, but his eyes were energetic. He smiled at her. When he did, he wasn't bad looking. Not quite like his cousin, Virgil, was terribly attractive. But then she thought most men would have a hard time competing with Virgil. No doubt that what had hooked Carolina, that pretty face. Maybe that air of mystery he had about him too had made Carolina forget about sensible matters. Genteel. Part of me, Naomi's father has said, that's what the man has to offer. Apparently also a rambling old house where you were liable to have bad dreams. God, this city seems so far away. I'd like to ask you for a favor, she said, after I exchanged morning pleasantries. As she spoke, she linked her arm to his, to his with a Fluted, a well-practiced motion, and they began walking together. I want to borrow one of your cars and go to town. I have letters I like to post. My father doesn't really know how I'm doing. You need me to drive you there? I can drive myself there. Francis made a face, head a station knee. I don't know what Virgil will say about that. She shrugged. You don't have to tell him. What? You don't think I can drive? I'll show you my license if you want. Francis ran a hand through his fair hair. It's not that. The family is very particular about the cars. And I'm very particular about driving on my own. Surely I don't need a chaperone. And you will make a terrible chaperone anyway. How so? You ever heard of a man playing a chaperone? You need a insufferable aunt. I can lend you one of mine for a weekend if you like. I'll cost you a car. Will you help me, please? I'm desperate. He chuckled as she stirred him outside. He picked up the car keys hanging from a hook in the kitchen. Lizzie, one of the maids, was rolling bread upon a flower table. She did not acknowledge either Naomi or Francis even one bit. The staff at the hat place was almost invisible, like in one of Carolina's fairy tales, Beauty and the Beast, that had been it, have it not. Invisible servants who cooked the meals and laid down the silverware. Ridiculous. Naomi knew all people who worked in her house by name, and they certainly would not be begrudge their chatter. That she, if she really knew the names of the staff at Hat Place, seems a small miracle. But she asked Francis, and Francis had a virtually introduced them. Lizzie, Mary, and Charles who liked the porcelain lock in the cabinets, had been imported by England many decades ago. They walked towards the shed, and he handed her the car keys. You won't get lost, Francis asked, leaning against the car window and looking down at her. I can manage. True enough, it wasn't as one would have ever attempt to get lost. The woods lit up or down the mountain, and down she went to the little town. She felt quite content during the drive and rolled her window to open the fresh, to enjoy the fresh mountain air. It wasn't such a bad place, she thought, once you got out of the house. It was the house that disfigured the land. Naomi parked the car by the town square, 
guessing both the post office and the medical clinic must be nearby. She was right and was quickly rewarded with the sight of a little green and white building that proclaimed itself the medical unit. Inside, there were three green chairs and silver silver posters explaining all the matters of diseases. There, there was a receiving desk, but it was empty, and a closed door with a black on it, and a doctor's name in large letters. Julio Eusebio Camayo, it said. She sat down, and after a few min- few minutes, the door opened, and came out a woman holding a toddler by the hand. Then the doctor poked his head through the doorway and nodded at her. Good day, he said. How can I help you? I'm Naomi Tabola, she said. You are Dr. Camayo? She had to ask because the man looked rather young. He was very dark and had short hair that he parted down the middle. And a little mustache that didn't really, really age him managed to make him a lo- look a bit ridiculous, like a child making a prison. He also wasn't wearing a doctor's white coat, just a beige and brown sweater. That's me. Come in, he said. Inside his office on the wall behind his desk, she indeed saw the certificate from the UNAM with his name in an elegant script. He also had a... Amor, the doors thrown open, filled with pills, cotton swabs, and bottles, a large my grave lay in the corner in a yellow pot. The doctor sat behind his desk, and Naomi sat on a plastic chair, which matched the ones in the rest of you. I don't think we met before, Dr. Camarillo said. I'm not around from around here. She said, placing her purse on her lap and leaning forward. I come to see my cousin. She's sick, and I thought you might take a look at her. She has tropiosis. Tropiosis? In the briefonio. The doctor asked, sounding quite astonished. I haven't heard anything about that. Not in the briefonio proper. At the high place. The Doyle's house, he said, haltingly. You are related to them? No, well, yes, by marriage. Rachel Doyle is married to my cousin, Carolina. I was hoping you go check on her. The young doctor looked confused. But wouldn't Dr. Cummins been taking care of her? He's their doctor. I would like a second opinion, I suppose, she said, and explained how strange Carolina seemed and her suspicions that she might require psychiatric attention. Dr. Camarillo listened patiently to her. When she was done, he twirled a pencil between his fingers. The thing is, I'm not sure I'll be welcome at High Place if I were show up there. The Doyles have always have their own prison. They don't mingle with the town folk, he said. When the mines was operational and they hired Mexican workers, they had them living at camp up the mountain. Arthur Cummins, senior, attended them to them. There were several epidemics back when the mine was open, you know. Lots of miners died, and Cummins had his hands full, but he never requested local help. I don't believe we think much of local prisons. What sort of epidemic was it? He tapped his pencil razor against his desk three times. It wasn't clear. A high fever, very tricky. People would say the oddest things. They rant and rave. They have conversions. They attack each other. People will get sick. They die. Then all will be well. And a few years later, the mystery illness will strike. I seen the English cemetery, Naomi said. There are many graves. That's only the English people. You can see the local cemetery. They said that the last epidemic around the time the revolution started, the Doyles didn't bother sending down the corpse for a proper boil barrel. They tossed them in a pit. That can be, can it? Who knows? The phrase carried with it a impressive distaste. The doctor didn't say, well, I believe it, but it seems there might be no reason why he shouldn't. You must be from 
it through for you then to know all this. For many near enough, he said, my family sold supplies to people at the Doyle mine, and when they shuttered it, they moved back to Pachuca. I went to study in Mexico City, but now I'm back. I wanted to help the people here. You should start by helping my cousin then, she said. Will you come up to the house? Dr. Camarillo smiled, but he shook his head. Apologic. I told you, you get me in trouble with the Cummins and the Doyles. What can I do to you? Aren't you the town's prison? The health clinic is public, and the government pays for the bandages, rubbing alcohol, and gas. But if the California is as small, it's needy. Most people are gold farmers. Back when the Spaniards controlled the mine, they could support themselves making tallow for the miners. Not now. There's a church and a very nice priest there, and he collects alms for the poor. And I bet the Doyles place money in his contribution box, and the priest is your friend, Naomi said. Cummins placed the contribution in the box. The Doyles don't bother with that, but it's their money. All the same, everyone knows it. She didn't think the Doyles had much money left. The mine has been closed for more than three decades. But their bank's accounts must have been a modest balance, and a little bit of cash might go a long way in an isolated town like El Tufuño. What to do now? She thought it over quickly and decided to take advantage of those dear lessons her father had considered a waste of money. Then you won't help me. <clears throat> Then you won't help me. You're afraid of them. Oh, and there I am without a friend in the world, she said, clutching her purse and standing up slowly, her lip quivering dramatically. Men always panic when she did that, afraid she'll cry. Men always so afraid of tears and having a hysterical woman on their hands. At once, the doctor made a placating motion and spoke quickly. I didn't say that. Then she pressed on, sounding hopefully, giving him the most fetching of smiles, the one she used when she wanted to get a policeman to let her go without a spinning ticket. Doctor, it will mean the world to me if you help. Even if I go, I'm no psychologist. Noyomi took out her handkerchief and clutched it, a little usual reminder that she could at any moment break into tears and start dabbing at her eyes. She sighed. I could head to Mexico City, but I don't want to leave Karina alone, especially if there's no need for it. I might be wrong, but you could send me a long trip back and forth. The train doesn't even run every day. Will you do me this little favor? Will you come? Naomi looked at him, and he looked at her with a dose of skippinism. But he nodded his head. I'll stop by Monday around noon. Thanks, she said, standing up quickly and shaking his hand, and then remembering the fullness of her errand. She paused. By the way, do you know a Martha Duval? Are you going around talking to every specialist in town? Why do you say that? She's the local healer. Do you know where she lives? My cousin wants a remedy from her. Does she? Well, I suppose it makes sense. Martha does have a lot of business with women in town. Cololobo tea is still a popular remedy for tuberculosis. Does it help? It's fi fine enough for coughs. Dr. Camarillo bent down over his desk and drew a map on his notepad and handed it to her. Naomi decides to walk to Dowal's house since he said it was nearby and turned out to be a good idea because the path, at least to a woman's house, would have been no good for a car and the way it was was a little convoluted. The streets following no plan, going chaotic. Naomi had to ask for directions despite the map. She spoke to a woman who was doing her laundry by the front door of her house, scrubbing a shirt against a battered washboard. The woman put down her bar of sorote soap and informed Naomi she had to go uphill a little further. The town neglected was more obvious the further you move from the central square and the church. 
The houses became shacks made up bri- bare brick, and everything seemed gray and dusty, with scrawny looking goats or chickens stuck behind rickety fences. Some dwellings were abandoned with no doors or windows left. She supposed the neighborhoods the neighbors had scavenged whatever wood, glass and other materials they could take. When they driven through town, Francis must have taken the most scenic of roads, and even then her impression had been of decay. The healer's house was very small and stood out because it was painted white and was better taken care of. A old woman with her hair in a long braid, wearing a blue ap- apron, sat outside by the door on a three-legged stool. She had two bowls next to her and was printing peanuts. In one bowl, she threw the discarded shells, and the other she threw the peanuts. The woman did not look up as Naomi approached her. She was humming a tune. Excuse me, Naomi said. I'm looking for Mata Duval. The humming decreased. You got the prettiest shoes I ever seen, the old woman said. Naomi glanced down at the pair of the black high heel shoes she was wearing. Thank you. I don't get many people with pretty shoes like that. The woman cracked another peanut open and tossed it into the bowl. Then she stood up. I'm Martha, she said, looking up at Naomi, her eyes cloudy with cataracts. Martha went into the house carrying a bowl in each hand. Naomi followed her inside into a small kitchen that also serves as a dining room. On a wall, there's a picture of the Sacred Heart and a bookshelf held plaster figurines of saint candles and bottles filled with herbs. From the ceiling, there's also hung herbs and dry flowers, lavender and esapsote and branches of rue. Naomi knew there were healers who made all sorts of merrimities, gathering herbs for hangovers and herbs for fevers, and even tricks to cure the evil eye. But Karina had never been the type to seek such cures. The first book had gotten Naomi really interested in anthropology, has been witchcraft, oracles, and magic among the a Sunday. When she tried to discuss it with Karina, Karina would not hear of it. The mere word witchcraft gave her a fright, and a healer of the wall sort of was two steps removed from witchcraft, not only handing out tonics, but also curing the susto by placing a cross of the holy palm on someone's head. No. Karina wouldn't have been the type to wear a bracelet of Ojo de Renato on her bra- wrist. How had she ended up at this house talking to Marta Duval then? The old woman placed the bowls on the table and pulled out a chair. When she sat down, there was a sudden fluttering of wings, which startled Naomi and the parrots room onto the woman's shoulder. Sit, Marta said, t- taking a peeled peanut and handing it to the carrot. Parrot, what do you want? Naomi sat down across from her. You made a remedy for my cousin, and she needs more of it. What was it? I'm not sure, but her name is Carolina. Do you remember her? The girl from High Place. The woman took another peanut and gave it to the parrot, which cocked its head and stared at Naomi. Yes, Carolina. How do you know her? I don't. Not really. Your cousin used to come to church once in a while. And she must have gotten talking to some with someone there because she came to see me, told me that she needed something to help her sleep. She visited me a couple of times. Last time I saw her, she was agitated, but wouldn't tell me about her problems. She asked me to mail a letter for her address to someone in Mexico City. Why didn't she mail it herself? I don't know, she said. Come Friday, if we don't see each other, mail this. So I did. Like I said, she wouldn't discuss her problems. She said she had bad dreams, and I tried to help her with that. Bad dreams? Naomi thought, recalling her nightmare. It wasn't hard to have bad dreams in a house like that. 
She placed her hands on top of her purse. Well, whatever you gave her must have worked because she wants more of it. More? The woman sighed. I told that girl no tea is going to make her feel better, not for long. What do you mean? That family is cursed. The woman touched the parrot's head, scratching it, and the, and the birds closed its eyes. You haven't heard the stories? There was a epidemic. Naomi said cautiously, wondering if she meant that. Yes, there was sickness, much sickness, but that wasn't the only thing. Miss Ruth, she shot them. Who is Miss Ruth? It's a famous story around these parts, I can tell it, but it will cost you a little. You're rather mercenary. I'm already going to pay for the medicine. We got to eat. Besides, it's a good story and no one knows it as well as I do. So you're a healer and a storyteller? Told you, young miss. We got to eat. The woman with a shrug. All right, I pay for a story. You have an ashtray, she asked, taking out her cigarettes and her lighter. Martha grabbed a pewter cup from the kitchen and placed it before her. And Naomi leaned forward with both elbows resting on the table and lit her cigarette. She offered the old woman a cigarette and Martha took two, smiling, but she did not light it either one, instead of tucking them into her apron pocket. Perhaps she smokes the cigarettes later or even sells them. Where to begin? Ruth, yes. Ruth was Mr. Doyle's daughter, Mr. Doyle's darling child. She wanted for nothing. Back then, they had many servants, always lots of servants to polish the silver and make tea. The bulk of those servants were people from the village, and they lived at the house. But sometimes they came downtown for the market and for other things, and they talk all about the pretty things at High Place and the pretty Miss Ruth. She was going to marry her cousin, Michael, it was, and they ordered a dress from Paris, and... Ivory had combs for her hair, but a week before the wedding, she grabbed a rifle and shot her groom, shot her mother, her aunt, and her uncle. She shot her father, but he survived, and she might have shot Rachel, her baby brother, but Miss Florence hid away with him. Or maybe Ruth had mercy. Naomi has haven't seen a single weapon in the house, but then they must have tossed the rifle, the rifle. There was only silver on display, and she wondered incautiously if the bullets the murderers had used might not have been made of silver. When she was done shooting them, she took the rifle and killed herself. The woman cracked a peanut. What a morbid tale, and yet this was not the conclusion. Merely a pause. There's more, isn't there? Yes. You're not going to tell me the rest? One has to eat, young miss. I'll pay. You won't be stingy? Never. Naomi had placed the box of cigarettes on the table. Martha extended a wrinkled hand and took the other one, again tucking in her apron. She smiled. The servants left after that. The people who remained in high place were family and trusted folks. They employed for a long time. They stayed there, stay out of the sight. Then one day... Miss Florence was selling on a train station off on a vacation when she had never set a foot outside that house. She came back married to a young man. Richard, he was called. He wasn't like the Doyles. He was talkative. He liked to come down to town in his car and have a drink and chat. He lived in London and New York and Mexico City. And you got the feeling that the house of the Doyles wasn't his favorite place of them all. He was talkative all right and he started talking strange things. What sort of things? Talks of ghosts and spirits and the evil eye. He was a strong man, Mr. Richard, until he wasn't, and he looked rather shabby and thin. Stopped coming into town and disappeared from the view. They found him at the bottom of the a ravine. There's lots of ravines here. You might have noticed that. Well, there he was, dead at 29, left behind a son. Francis, she thought. Pale-faced Francis with soft hair and his softer smile. She heard nothing of his long saga, but then she posed it was not the kind of thing everyone would like to discuss. It's all sound tragic, but I'm not sure I call it a curse. You call it a criticism, would you? Yes, I suppose you would. 
but the fact is everything they touch rots. Rots. The word sound is so ugly, it seems so stick to the tongue. It made Naomi want to bite her nails, even though she never no done such a thing. She was particularly about her hands. Ugly nails wouldn't have done for her. It was odd, the house. The Doyles and their servants were all a odd a lot, but the curse? No. It couldn't be anything but a coincidence, she said, shaking her head. Could be. Can you make the same remedy you made for Carolina the last time? It's no easy thing. I have to gather the ingredients, and it will take me a little while. It wouldn't solve the issue. It's like I said, the problem is that house, that cursed house. Jump on that train and leave it behind. That's what I told your cousin. I thought she listened, but what do I know? Yes, I'm sure you did. What's the price of this remedy? Anyway, Naomi asked. The remedy and the stories? Yes, that too. The woman named me some. Naomi opened her purse and took out a few bills. Mata Duval might have cataracts, but she saw the bills clearly enough. It will take me a week. Come back in a week. But I make no promises, the woman said, extending her hand, and Naomi placed the bills in her palm. The woman folded them and tucked them in her, into her apron pocket. Can you spare another cigarette, she added. Very well. I hope you like them. Naomi said, handing her one more. There. Go, was. They're not for me. Then for who? St. Luke, the evangelist, she said, pointing to one of the plaster figurines on her shelves. Cigarettes for saints? He likes them. He has expensive taste. Naomi said, wondering if she could find a store that sold anything even close to Go, was in town. She had to replenish her stock soon. The woman smiled and Naomi handed her another bill. What the hell? As she said, everyone has to eat and God knows how many customers the old lady had. Martha seemed very pleased and smiled even more. Well, I'm off then. Don't let St. Luke smoke all the cigarettes at once. The woman chuckled and they walked outside. They shook hands and the woman's Squinted. How do you sleep? The woman asked. Fine. You have dark circles under your eyes. It's the cold up here. It keeps me awake at night. I hope it's that. Naomi dealt up her odd dream, the golden glow. It has been a rather hideous nightmare, but she has not had the time to analyze it. She had a friend who swore by Young. But Naomi had never understood the whole, the dream is the dreamer, a bit, nor had she cared to interpret her dreams. Now she recalled one particular thing Young wrote. Everyone carries a shadow, and like a shadow, the woman's words hung over Naomi as he drove back to high place.